he got neutered. So he's wearing a collar. And he hates it! <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Yes, Crew Trime. If you are new here, hello, welcome. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like fun to you, you're in the right place. So make sure that you subscribe to this channel, turn on all the little notifications and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. Today's story was recommended by a lovely Canadian viewer named Jess. Hi Jess! It's been a while since we've covered a case from our neighbors to the north and this one is one of the most notorious. It's also pretty freaking terrible so hold on to your butts. This is the story of Robert William Picton. On February 22nd, 2002, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police or the RCMP, in conjunction with the Vancouver Police Department, held a press conference. The press conference was to announce that the Missing Women Task Force had arrested Robert Picton, a pig farmer from Port Coquitlam, for two counts of first-degree murder. This was the first time that a suspect's name was actually mentioned publicly, but within days, more information was coming out, and soon, Picton's name was everywhere. Soon, three more murder charges were added, and by 2005, DNA and personal belongings for at least 20 unidentified women were found on his farm. This was just the beginning of what would become Canada's biggest homicide investigation in history. So how did we get here? Let's start at the very beginning. Robert William Picton was known to friends and family as Willie. He was born on October 24, 1949 to Helen and Leonard Picton of Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, Canada, just east of Vancouver. The youngest of three, Willie, had a brother named David and a sister named Linda. The Pictons were pig farmers and they operated a 40-acre livestock farm. Willie's childhood was described as brutal and difficult. Leonard, his father, was not emotionally connected to his kids in any meaningful way. And his mom, Helen, was quite abusive. His sister, Linda, was sent off to live with relatives because apparently the farm was not a good place to raise a girl. Helen expected the boys to work long hours on the farm, even on school days. Eventually, that turned into her only allowing them to go to school like two days a week. You know, the priority was the farm work. When the boys actually did go to school, they would be in dirty clothes. And like, I'm talking pig shit dirty clothes. Willie also had a low IQ. He struggled in school even after being placed in special classes. So Willie being intellectually behind his peers and being the stinky kid, not a winning combination, we'll say. Finally, at age 14, Willie dropped out of school altogether. And Willie and his brother Dave stayed on the farm for 15 years after his parents died. Helen passed away in 1977 and their father Leonard passed away just a year later. So the Picton brothers inherited the farm and they sold off parcels of the land to local developers and they actually became quite wealthy. Over the years, the brothers would hire a, this revolving cast of people from town to come work on the farm and some would even live there. Most of these people came from the east side of Vancouver, which was about a half hour drive from the Picton's farm and it's one of those areas where everything bad is happening, like a skid row vibes, a lots of illegal drug activity, sex workers, crime stuff, you get it. Well, Willie spent a lot of time in East Vancouver becoming a regular customer of the sex workers. He was well known in that area. Okay, so we started out talking about Willie being arrested in 2002, but he and his brother Dave had actually been on the police's radar for many years already. Dave had been charged with sexual assault in 1992 after a woman told police that she had been attacked by him in his trailer at their farm, but she had somehow escaped. He was fined a whole thousand dollars and given 30 days probation. What a punishment, eh? After the Picton brothers started selling off parcels of land, you know, a few years after the parents passed away, the farm fell into disrepair and they were doing less and less pig farming and more nonprofit charity work. Well, I mean, that's what they called it. In 1996, they converted an old slaughterhouse that was on the property and officially registered it as an event space. They called it the Piggy Palace Good Time Society. 
and I have to say, that's an amazing name. I love it. <laughs> the Piggy Palace Good Time Society. It sounds like a good time. I'd wear that t-shirt. I'd get that keychain. So the official description on file with the Canadian government was that the Piggy Palace Good Time Society was a special event charity space. But in reality, all they did was put on raves. I mean, this, this was the 90s after all. These raves were serious parties that would draw over 2,000 guests, you know, including sex workers from the East Side and Hell's Angels, bikers. Lots of drug activity going on. The local police started responding to a lot of complaints, mostly like zoning infractions and things like that. Eventually, it was more trouble than it was worth and the nonprofit disbanded. In late March of 1997, Willie had taken an East Vancouver woman called Stitch back to the farm to engage in her services. Stitch described the farm as more of a junkyard. You know, lots of broken down vehicles and equipment and stuff everywhere. Anyway, Stitch needed the money to fund her drug use. So she had gone back to the farm with Willie, did what she needed to do, and then after their transaction, she was getting ready to leave, Willie attacked her. She was in the kitchen getting a number out of the phone book and she heard a click. Willie had appeared from out of nowhere and snapped a handcuff over her wrist and held a knife to her. Stitch knew that if he had gotten that other handcuff on her, it would be over for her. So a struggle ensued. Willie stabbed her four times with the knife, twice in the stomach, once in her arm, and once in her chest, puncturing her lung. But she wasn't going down easy. She grabbed the knife and got in a stab on Willie too before she was able to escape. And she ran for her life down the long driveway, out to the road, and she was able to flag down a motorist who helped take her to the hospital. Having suffered a stab wound, Willie actually drove himself to Eagle Ridge Hospital, the same one that she went to. When the attendant took Willie's clothes, they found the handcuff key in his pants pocket, and it just so happened to fit the handcuffs of the other emergency room stabbing victim that had handcuffs on her wrist. So Willie was literally caught red-handed and was charged with the attempted murder of Stitch, real name Wendy Lynn Eistetter. But, and this is infuriating, since Wendy Stitch was a sex worker with substance abuse addiction issues, the prosecutor declared her to be an unreliable witness and the charges against Willie were dropped. What? Excuse me, what? In 1997, more than a dozen women had gone missing from the East Side, most of them sex workers, drug addicts, disconnected from family that would miss them report them missing. Unfortunately, that also means that there isn't a lot of information or pictures of the women, but I'll do my best. Marnie Fry was a happy child, but in her teens, she started using cocaine and heroin. On her 23rd birthday, August 30th, 1997, her birthday came and went without a phone call to her family which was very unusual. Her parents were aware that she was struggling with some drug addiction, but she was very much engaged with the family and would call to check in with them often. She would never miss a holiday or a birthday and certainly wouldn't have missed calling them on her birthday. Her mother, Lynn Fry, reported her missing but the police told her that there wasn't much they could do. Veteran street cop Dave Dixon had been working on the downtown east side since 1980, and over the years, he'd seen countless reports of missing women. And in 1997, he started compiling lists of names of women that he hadn't seen for a week, a month, whatever. He would check police records to see if there had been an arrest, but found nothing. Dave's wife actually worked at the hospital and she would often see some of the East Side women come through for, you know, treatment, but she hadn't seen any of the women either. So those without any arrests or hospitalization information all just started to add up. Eventually, he had 31 names on this list. Many of these women were also collecting social assistance. So Dave took the list to the Ministry of social services to see if these welfare checks had been picked up. And all 31 social service cases had been closed. None of the checks had been cashed. These women were nowhere to be found, so Dave's gut was telling him that there was a serial killer on the loose. But without any bodies, maybe the women just moved away. The missing persons task force had nothing to investigate, but Constable Dixon kept working in the background. Well, fast forward to January of 1998, Carrie Kosky went missing, then Inga Hall a month later. In April of 1998, 
28-year-old Sarah DeVries went missing. Something was really wrong. When the public got wind of it, including women from First Nations groups, they organized a protest in front of the Vancouver Police Department. Finally, the RCMP was pressured into making a public response. At a press conference, they relayed that there wasn't anything to investigate. In the absence of a corpse, a crime scene, a specific date of disappearance, or forensic evidence, there just wasn't anything to investigate. And they didn't say it out loud, but it was clear that the appetite to investigate a bunch of missing druggy hookers, rude, just wasn't there. But Constable Dixon's efforts and the public interest eventually launched a task force. As time went on, detectives chased after countless leads as more and more women disappeared. Many of the suspects were nameless, making the investigation even more futile. But then, in late 1998, police got their best lead yet from 37-year-old Bill Hiscox. Bill had been widowed two years earlier, was down on his luck, and ended up working at a salvage yard owned by his sister's sometimes boyfriend, Willie Pickton, and his brother Dave. Bill would have to often go to the farm to pick up his paychecks. He described the farm as super creepy, junky, stuff all over the place, and it was also patrolled by a 600-pound attack pig. A pig! running around like it's a German Shepherd. <laughs> Weird. Well, after Willie Picton had been charged with that attempted murder a few months earlier of Wendy Eistetter, you know, Stitch, Bill started squinting. He started doing the math. You know, the farm has stuff everywhere. In, when he would come there to get his paychecks, he would see things like women's belongings, purses, ID cards. Willie was also a supremely creepy guy who spent a lot of time in East Vancouver frequenting the downtown girls, the same downtown girls who were going missing. Bill went to the police and told them they needed to look into Willie. Several times, investigators went to the farm and talked to Willie, and he even invited them to take a look around. But all they found was a bunch of random junk. I mean, obviously, they were only looking at what they could see without digging. As more time passed, more women disappeared. In June of 2001, 22-year-old Andrea Jonesberry was reported missing after she missed her daily dose of methadone three days in a row. At the same time, Serena Abbotsway, a well-known area sex worker, went missing. She had actually been interviewed a few months earlier by a documentary crew, and she said that she had a sixth sense when it came to the men that she spent time with. She said that she could pick out the bad ones, and she felt that she could be safe. Later, 34-year-old Diane Rock and 26-year-old Mona Wilson disappeared. That same year, another witness called the Missing Women Hotline with a tip. This time, it was Scott Chubb. Scott had lived and worked on the Picton farm, and he told police that Willie Picton told him that the best way to kill somebody was to inject them with windshield wiper fluid. Ugh. Willie said that autopsies aren't typically done on junkies, so if the RCMP found a body with needle marks, police would just think it was an overdose. So that's a pretty compelling tip, but you know what really got the police interested enough to issue a search warrant? Guns. When Scott was spilling his guts to the police, he told them that there were lots and lots of illegal firearms spread around the Picton property. He had personally seen these firearms and even fired them himself. So, on February 5th, 2002, a horde of investigators and police arrived at 953 Dominion Avenue to serve Willie Picton with a search warrant for the illegal firearms. Once they were inside Willie's trailer, they quickly found a lot of women's belongings. Clothing, IDs, purses and a lot of them belonged to the missing women. Once they found the inhaler that had Serena Abbott's Way's name on it, remember Serena from the documentary? The search warrant expanded to allow them to look for evidence of murder. Police found body parts, including several heads and hands. Serena, or what was left of her, was found in a bucket in a deep freeze. Investigators also found human remains in a wood chipper. Willie had been using it to turn the victims into pig feed. Disgusting! 
it turns out that sometimes the parts were fed directly to the pigs and other times they were mixed in barrels with other pig parts and then dumped at a disposal plant. This search turned into a large scale excavation of the entire 17 acre farm and it cost the Canadian government $70 million. It became the biggest homicide investigation in Canada's history. And now we're back to where we started, where they held the press conference saying that they arrested Willie for the murders of Serena Abbotsway and Mona Wilson. Well, each day that Willie was in custody seemed to come with new charges. Every time they found more evidence of more missing women on the farm, more press conferences were held. On April 2nd, 2002, Willie was charged with the murders of Jacqueline McDonnell, Diane Rock, and Heather Bottomley. A sixth murder charge was added for Andrea Josbury, was added on April 9th, followed by a charge for Brenda Wolf. On September 20th, four more charges were added. Georgia Papin, Patricia Johnson, Helen Hallmark, and Jennifer Firminger. On October 3rd, another four. Heather Chinook, Tanya Hollick, Sherry Irving, and Inga Hall. Finally, on May 26th, 2005, 12 more charges were added. The murders of Kara Ellis, Andrea Borhaven, Deborah Lynn Jones, Marnie Fry, Tiffany Drew, Carrie Korsky, Sarah DeVries, Cynthia Felix, Angela Jardine, Wendy Crawford, Diana Melnick, and a Jane Doe, bringing the total to 27 murder charges. After Willie's arrest, a former Picton farm worker named Lynn Ellingston told police about an incident years earlier where she saw Willie skinning a woman that he had hanging from a meat hook. She hadn't come forward before because Willie had threatened to do the same thing to her. It came out later that Willie may have used an industrial meat grinder to dispose of some of the victims by adding them to the pork he was selling to the public. Willie wasn't super cooperative with police. Obviously, he did not confess. But the RCMP put an undercover officer in the same jail cell with Willie, hoping to gather more information, and it worked. Willie told him all about his routine of picking up sex workers, enjoying their services, then attacking, killing, and disposing of them on his property. Willie told him that he got caught because he got sloppy. And he was kind of pissed off at the timing of his arrest because he wanted to kill at least one more girl to bring his grand total to 50. So Willie's trial was long and exhausting. It kicked off on January 30th, 2006, and some of the evidence presented included photographs, DNA profiles, human remains, handheld saws, night vision goggles, fur line handcuffs, syringes filled with windshield wiper fluid, and a 22 caliber revolver with a dildo over the barrel. <laughs> Zoinks! There were some 235,000 exhibits that were processed by the forensic lab, so going through the chain of custody alone was gonna take weeks. In the end, the judge in the case decided to sever the charges, effectively setting aside the bulk of it so as to not overwhelm the jury. The actual trial testimony proceeded on August 4th, 2006, on the first counts of first-degree murder, and it still went on for months. After deliberating for nine days, the jury reached a verdict. Robert Willie Picton was found not guilty of first degree murder on those six counts. Are you fucking kidding me? First degree meaning, you know, premeditated. But hang on, hang on. Instead, they found him guilty of second degree murder on all six counts. The jury didn't think he planned it. I, I don't know how you kill six people in a row not planned. So I am confusion. Either way, Willie ended up receiving the maximum sentence, life in prison, with uh, no possibility of parole for at least 25 years, which is actually the same sentence that would have been imposed for the first degree murders. So potato, potato. Coincidentally, this video is actually going up on YouTube on February 22nd, 2024, on the same day that Willie will become eligible for day parole. Apparently that's a thing where you can be paroled during the day and then you have to go back to prison at night or whatever. He'll become eligible for full parole in 2027. But will he actually be granted parole? I guess we'll have to wait and see. And in case you were wondering, Willie's brother Dave was initially a co-defendant in those firearm charges, but those were dropped and he was never charged in connection to any of the murders of any of these women. And neither were any of these friends that 
clearly knew what was happening. The Picton case put the spotlight on how the Canadian government handled or mishandled the investigations into these missing women from Vancouver. It also became part of a larger evaluation that was later launched in 2012, the Missing Women Commission of Inquiry, to evaluate the response of the police, recommend changes of how missing women and suspected homicides are handled, how and why the 1997 attempted murder charges against Picton were handled, and how to improve cases that involve more than one investigating organization. If you're a nerd like me and you want to read the executive summary of that report, I will link it down below. And that, for now, is the story of Robert, the pig farmer killer, Picton. Thanks again to Jess for the terrible story suggestion. If you have a crew crime story that you want to recommend to me, just look down in the description box for the link to the Google Doc where you can visit, input all of the dirty details, I'd love to hear from you. If you also want to know any of the makeup that I used in today's Luke, just Luke down in the description box. Everything is linked. If I'm using something that's uh, extremely old and unavailable, I'll find you something similar. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week, and you can follow me on all of the other socials as well. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! 20 fucking seven. You start. The police started com complaining. So how can I make my skin look actually good today? <laughs> Some four more charges from their family who would Deborah. Debbie, what is it, girl? Debbie. Debbie girl.